Hey, it's Tim back for Wrong Sports for part two of this epic losing streak for the Columbia Lions in the mid-1980s. If you missed it in part one, I went over the first two years of this epic losing streak. So basically the end of 1983, 1984, and 1985. And just to give you a quick recap of that, Columbia is on a 21-game losing streak coming into this 1986 season. They just went through their most chaotic season in 1985 with Jason Garrett's dad as head coach. But the school would get rid of James Garrett a week or two after the season when he assumed he was going to come back, even though he shit-talked his punter who quit on the team, and he had accusations of physical abuse of his players. But anyway, the school would quietly push Coach Garrett out, and Coach Garrett never gave a real comment on why he was pushed out. But anyway, you can see more about that in my previous video. But before I get to the end of this streak, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. And as always, make sure you find me on Twitter, at SportsWronged, as we get back to this epic Columbia Lions losing streak. Okay, so the crazy 1985 season is over and three weeks after that season, Garrett left Columbia and Columbia would then hire Larry McElrevy, who was a former assistant at Yale and Penn before becoming the coach of New Haven and turning them into a winning team in three years. He would walk into a locker room that was demoralized by the last year and the way it ended. But McElrevy just preached a calm tone and told his team that if they did the work that eventually they would reap the benefits. So the team was going to be without their quarterback the last two seasons, Henry Santos, as he graduated, which would result in Columbia using two or three quarterbacks per game. But at least at running back, they had Chirico, who had over 500 yards and a handful of touchdowns the previous season. On defense, they would have a linebacker or two usually show up on the honorable mentions list, but no offensive or defensive players would be on the 1986 all Ivy League teams. So not looking good for 1986 as we start here. And they would start their season on the road versus Harvard, who were the second place team in the Ivy League last year and looking to start off the season on the right foot. Well, it was a cakewalk for Harvard as they had over 300 rushing yards and held Columbia to 140 total yards all game. Plus, Harvard would take a 17 to nothing lead after the first quarter, and also they would have 140 yards to minus 12 advantage in that quarter. And they also had a 31 to nothing lead at half. So Columbia could pretty much do nothing. They used three quarterbacks in this game, and they only averaged one yard per carry. They even did nothing when Harvard brought in their bench and their third stringers in the second half. The final score was 34 to nothing, and this was Harvard's best win for a while, as they were shut out in their next three games. So in hindsight, this might have been the best way for Harvard to start off their season, but not the best for Columbia. Okay, so if you thought that last game was brutal, this week two game was really brutal, as they would play out-of-conference rival Lafayette. Lafayette was coming into this game 1-1, one and, one, and they haven't lost to Columbia since 1980. Lafayette got the advantage early, but Columbia did actually score early as they had 7 points by the third quarter, but Lafayette had 26 and they were looking to end this game early as they had been accustomed to this decade. But Columbia would start to look pretty good and they actually had a comeback late in the third with a rushing touchdown and then another touchdown in the fourth quarter. And the defense would hold off Lafayette for all of the fourth quarter and give Columbia one more shot to win. Columbia drove to the 5 yard line with 12 seconds left and their new quarterback, David Patello, who played most of the game and the second half, snapped the ball and was quickly looking for an escape or for an open receiver. He found neither, as Lafayette would sack him about 10 yards back as time ran out, and Columbia lost once again, 26-21. to But this was their closest loss in a while. Unfortunately, though, the losing streak sits at 23. After that missed comeback, they traveled to Penn to play the undefeated and defending champions in the Ivy League. It didn't go well for them, and and really, what could you expect? Coach McElravey was even pretty ready for this because he knew that his team couldn't match up to Penn talent-wise, but his team did have a lot of heart and fight as uh, this game went on. The game didn't look so bad at half as it was only 14 to nothing, but after that, Penn turned it on for four more touchdowns. Penn sat many starters in the second half, giving Columbia the shot to score, and they did so, so that they couldn't get shut out, and they lost this game 42 to seven. Penn had over 500 total yards, they had over 300 yards rushing, and the game could have been a lot worse had Penn not had 17 penalties, costing them over 150 yards, 
plus if they didn't sit everyone in the second half. But it was clear after this game that the Lions didn't have the talent to compete in the Ivy League or the FCS for that matter, and it wasn't clear when they were going to get any better. And Game 4 was versus an interesting team in Princeton. Princeton were 0-3 coming into this game, and don't worry, none of Garrett's sons were playing for the Tigers this year due to transferring rules. However, the Tigers didn't need them, as they got out to a 20-0 lead before Columbia scored and tried once again for a comeback. That didn't happen, though. But Princeton made a ton of mistakes, like two interceptions and three fumbles, giving Columbia a chance in this game. The Princeton defense held off Columbia throughout the fourth quarter and held on to get their first win of the season, 20-14. So Columbia's losing streak now sits at 25 straight losses as their next games were the bottom of the barrel. And the quicker we get through the rest of these games, the better, as Columbia faced Yale on the road and then Colgate at home. Yale was not good again this season as they were 1-3 coming in, and Yale just ran all over Columbia with 255 yards and got some timely interceptions with four of them. They also got two fumbles to shut out Columbia 47-0. Columbia did get close to scoring as they had over 240 yards, but they started three quarterbacks who all threw picks in this game, and the streak stays alive. Up next was Colgate, who were 0-6 coming into this game, and Colgate lost to Yale two weeks previous, so that might give you an idea of where this game is going. Colgate's star running back had over 180 yards rushing and three touchdowns, and their quarterback had a perfect completion percentage in the first half as they would score 34 points. Columbia did score in the first half on defense, and on a Santos touchdown pass, they would be down 34-8 to at half. Columbia didn't do anything in the second, and they would eventually lose this game by their worst score in a while, 54-8 to at home, to make their record 0-6. So this next one was different as Columbia would play Villanova, who were a D3 independent squad. The reason for that was that they stopped playing in 1980 before reinstating the program to the FCS, which they would be in in 1988. But this year, Villanova was mostly playing D3 and D2 schools, with Columbia their only FCS or 1AA team on schedule. Most fans and alumni of Columbia were thinking that this could be the game that the streak could finally end. And it started that way, as Columbia scored first, and they had a 28-14 lead at half. But after half was when the usual trouble started for Columbia, as they fumbled and fumbled then threw a pick, all leading to Villanova touchdowns, and then Villanova had a lead 35-28. to And there were still seven minutes left in the third quarter. Apparently ABC and other TV and radio outlets were calling the school wanting to find out if they had indeed ended the streak. However, there was still time left for the Lions, but after another Nova touchdown, Columbia couldn't come back, and they lost. 42 to 34, so the streak still lives. They had their final away game next versus Dartmouth in New Hampshire, and Columbia had five interceptions and three fumbles, and even though it was 14 to nothing at half, it ended 41 to nothing, and the less said about it, the better. But they had two final games at home, first against Cornell, who were undefeated in the Ivy, and with the win would play Penn next week for the Ivy League title. Cornell had the best defense in the Ivy League this year, and they weren't giving up a touchdown in their last three games, and it continued in this game versus Columbia, as it was 28 to nothing. In Cornell, and it would continue in this game as Cornell ended this game pretty easily 28 to nothing. And now the losing streak has reached 30 straight losses. The final game was versus Brown, who were 500 again and looking to make it 14 in a row versus Columbia. Nothing of value here as it was 28 to nothing Brown at half, and the final would be 45 to 7, so at least they weren't shut out for a third straight year. Well, the season was over and Coach McElravey was going to be hanging around another year, so there was no chaos with coaches. He didn't say anything stupid about punters. He didn't make any players quit. No nothing. He was going to be coming back for the 1987 season. But a crazy stat here was that they had 11 seniors that played all four years with Columbia. This season includes freshmen too, and they were the first senior class to never win a varsity game. They went 2-4 and four as a freshman team, but they did not win as a sophomore, junior, or senior. But not only will another one of their classes break a record, I'll be talking about another school and another one of my deep dives that will also be having several senior classes that didn't have a win. The alumni and staff were mad last year after Jim Garrett's season, but this 1986 season was so much worse, at least statistically, not emotionally. They didn't have a 1,000-yard passer or a 500-yard rusher this season. Patello, their best quarterback, had 894 yards passing, and their best running back, Chirico, had 319 rushing yards. 
To go along with that this year, they had their worst Ivy League season as they were outscored 257 to 28, which means on average they lost every Ivy League game 37 to 4. They were shut out four times, which again was an Ivy League first, but they probably should have been shut out in more games like that Penn game where Penn played their second team all second half and that Brown game where again they scored in the second half versus the backups of Brown. But the streak lives another year as we will get to 1987. The only reason these guys play football is because they couldn't make the band. The football team may stink, but the debate team's nationally ranked. So the 1987 season is here. The losing streak is at 31 and only four more losses and they beat Northwestern's record set only five years earlier. Coach McElrevy was back and this time he had a better defense as they played through some issues in 1986 and they would get better this year. Along with that, Columbia also brought back a really good defensive player in Matt Sotel. He was on the first team Ivy League, which was the first time a player since 1981 from Columbia made that list. And it was also the first time a player from Columbia would show up on either the first or the second team list since 1985. So knowing that they actually had some talent on defense makes you feel a little bit better because they couldn't possibly be any worse than they were last year. And here's something else funny, their punter Matt Pollard was named to the second team Ivy League in 1987, just two years after Coach Garrett made one of the punters quit on his team, so there you go. On offense, meanwhile, Columbia couldn't find who they wanted to play at quarterback, even though Putello, the leading passer, was back this year. McElrevy would use at least three quarterbacks this season, sometimes he would use three in a game. The running game was putrid too last year, but they would not have the leading rusher Chirico, so they would start with a brand new slate of running backs. Their offensive line was the star of the offense, which isn't saying a lot, but they did have an offensive lineman, Paul Childers, make the Ivy League second team this year. In addition, this next player wasn't a star on the field so much, but he did become a TV star later in Matthew Fox. He was a receiver on Columbia this year and next year, and he would also be in some of the box scores this season, so I feel like I had to mention him. But let's start the season as Columbia saw their first four games as the last time they would have a chance to not live in college football infamy, so they would have to win one of these games. But it wasn't going to happen in week one as they started at home versus Harvard. Harvard coach Joe Resick, who was coached there since the late 1960s, was trying to turn his team around after a three-win season in 1986 and he pretty much did what he did in 1986 and take it to Columbia early and then he backed off in the second half. Harvard did that this year by taking a 28 to nothing lead into half and had over 200 yards of total offense by that point. Meanwhile, Columbia struggled hard as they played new quarterback Matt Less, who also played wide receiver this year too, and he did pretty much nothing of value, completing only 25% of his passes. He also had two interceptions this game. Plus, he got sacked a few times, ruining their rushing total, which was mostly gathered by their running back this season, Chris Della Piedra, who had 64 yards. Columbia didn't get within Harvard's red zone, as the closest they got was the 34-yard line, so obviously they lost this game big time, 35 to nothing. So they got two more losses and they tie the record and three and they have it and Lafayette was up next and some thought that this might be the best chance for them to win as last year they played them tough but this year coach McElravey knew that Lafayette had the better team and Lafayette showed it. They went on a 10 play 91 yard drive in the first quarter to score first which led to another one before Columbia ended up scoring. The score was by the star of their offense the first two games, running back Della Pietra, as he ran for a 40-plus yard touchdown run, and he had 76 rushing yards, but Lafayette took over and scored the remaining points while keeping Columbia's offense from doing pretty much anything, as they had three picks and picked up another three fumbles, so this game was over, 38-7. But at least there was something funny about this game after because Coach McElravey was asked for his comments on what he would do if this team actually won a game. His response was, I'd probably cut my Mylanta in half, but he was just looking for anything positive. And that last comment too is just making me like this guy even more because he was trying to stay positive as his record at Columbia was 0-12 right now and they trudged on to play Penn. Penn were Ivy League champs and undefeated last year, but this year they lost most of those players from last year and they were 0-2. The game started and Columbia was taking it to them mostly on the ground as both of their running backs had 70 
79 yards of total rushing. But when they got close to scoring, they screwed it up as they got inside the Penn 10-yard line and either got picked or fumbled. Meanwhile, their defense was stepping up as Penn could only get field goals through the first three quarters, keeping Columbia in this game. They were only down 9-0. But in the fourth quarter, Penn finally got in the end zone on two rushing touchdowns to win this game 23 to nothing. Columbia had over 130 total yards, but with five turnovers and only completing four passes, they couldn't do anything. And now they tied the losing streak record at 34. And the game to make them record holders was against, of all teams, Princeton. Princeton was 2-1 after a loss the previous week, and what was even bigger was, Princeton was starting all three of Garrett's sons at the time in this game. Quarterback Jason, running back Judd, and wide receiver John all would lead the team this year and next in their stats. Princeton and the Garretts took it to Columbia quickly, as Princeton had 21 points in less than 10 minutes on two Judd Garrett touchdown runs. Plus, there was a 74-yard touchdown pass from Jason to John, so pretty much the Garrett brothers did all the damage on their own. Columbia didn't score until the fourth quarter, and by that time it was 38 to nothing. Jason Garrett had 173 passing yards and a touchdown, but Judd was the star that he showed he could be on the Columbia freshman team as he had 140 yards rushing and three touchdowns. Also, the Garretts gave Columbia loss number 35, and they now have the record for Division I or FCS. They welcome 2-2 two two Yale to try and break this hex. Yale scored first, but Columbia would tie the game on their punter, Matt Pollard, turning to a quarterback on a fourth down, so I guess anyone could have thrown a pass on Columbia this year. They were only happy for a few moments, as less than two minutes later, Yale would get the lead back and never lose it. Yale coach Carm Koza was friends with McElravey and played his backups in the fourth, resulting in another touchdown pass, this time by Putello, to make it 27-13, as this loss would solidify the losing streak to Columbia as they would move on next week on the road to Bucknell. And Bucknell really took it to Columbia as they were looking to get back to 500. They scored in their first seven possessions. They had over 400 total yards. Columbia did score in the second half, but Bucknell was resting a lot of their players. Bucknell wasn't an Ivy League team, so they didn't care too much about holding back, and the final was 62-20. to Okay, that last game might have been a blowout, but Columbia actually looked alright in these final four games. First, they played another out-of-conference game in Lehigh at home, and it would end close 26-10. to But again, Columbia was scoring late, so this really should have been a bigger blowout, and this loss would give them number 38 in a row. And next game versus Dartmouth was fun, as Columbia fought them all game, intercepting Dartmouth two times, as well as picking up another fumble. The connection of Putello to Della Pietra gave Columbia a 7-2 lead in the second quarter, which was one of the only times that Columbia had a lead in the second quarter this season, before Dartmouth would score again, taking a 9-7 lead. Columbia would kick a field goal before half, and they had a 10-9 lead. The one-point lead held throughout most of the second half, but turnovers hurt Columbia as they had three of them, and they gave Dartmouth a chance to win at the end. Dartmouth took advantage, kicking a field goal with 1.45 left to give them a 12-10 lead. Columbia would drive down the field, but they missed a 36-yard field goal with seconds remaining, and they lost 12-10, giving them loss number 39. They traveled to upstate New York to play Cornell and their great passing game. Columbia would stall Cornell's running game early, but could not stop their passing game, as it would shred Columbia's defense for over 250 yards and three passing touchdowns. Cornell would score three touchdowns in the second quarter, and Columbia would never be able to come close after that quarter, though Cornell would sit a lot of players in the second half, allowing Columbia to get a couple of second-half touchdowns, so the final was 31-20, to closer than it seems. Columbia now have 40 straight losses, and they have one more game this season to end the streak as they played Brown. Brown beat down Columbia the last two years, but this one wasn't an easy one for Brown. Columbia was clearly getting better through the season, and it showed in this game, as they took it to Brown early and had a lead through most of the first and second half. But the trouble would start in the fourth quarter again, which was where a lot of their problems occurred, as Brown was down 16-6 with under eight minutes left. But they would start their comeback as they scored a touchdown with 540 left to cut the lead to three points. After a quick punt by Columbia, Brown took advantage and got the ball to the goal line but fumbled the ball, giving the ball back to Columbia. 
The people in attendance at Brown were very nervous thinking that this was going to be the game that Columbia would finally win. But it wouldn't happen, as the officials took two minutes to give the ball back to Brown, and Brown would get one more chance to score on fourth and two, and they did so, giving them the lead 19-16. Columbia tried to take the lead but were intercepted on a last minute drive and they would end their season again with another crushing loss to Brown. That loss gave Columbia 41 straight losses. They were 0-10 for the season, but they looked a lot better in games this season. It would show on offense as they were only shut out twice. They did score 104 points or just over 10 points per game. They did score double digits six times to end the season and were close in a few games to end here. Their quarterback this season, David Patello, would not come back for the 1988 season, but over 1986 and 87, he was their most significant and was probably their most consistent passer as he had over 850 yards passing in 86 and 87, which wasn't that much, but they were playing three or four quarterbacks over the game. So it's pretty surprising he even had that many yards. They also didn't have a running back with more than 500 yards this season as their leading rusher had 418 yards. And the guy I mentioned a lot at running back, Della Pietra, he wasn't even the leading rusher this season. Meanwhile, on defense, they gave up 311 points or 31.1 points per game. And the points were really coming in to start the season, but they got mellowed out after that Bucknell thrashing. And one more thing I wanna mention about their defense was their best player in Matt Sodal. He would graduate after the season and he ended his run at Columbia with out a win. Well, the real question isn't uh, why Columbia continues to lose. The real question is why does Columbia continue to play? I, I just don't have any answer for that. So as you can see by the way they ended the 1987 season, the streak was slowly loosening its grip on this team. Coming into 1988, Coach McElravey was ready, and he was calling this year the year that they would finally end the streak, as they were bringing back a couple of pretty good players on their offensive line, one of those being Paul Childers, as he would be a second team All-Ivy this year. Their quarterback situation was a mess again, as they played at least four quarterbacks during this season, and they played three in their first game alone. Their running back, though, was the constant part of this offense, as they would have junior running back Greg Abaruzzi back, and they would also bring in newcomer Solomon Johnson, who was named Rookie of the Year for the Ivy League this year. So with those two positive things on offense, you can see that they were feeling pretty good coming into the season. Their defense, meanwhile, didn't have their best player back, Matt Soto, but they did have Bob Paschkel on their defensive line back, and he would be on the second team All-Ivy this year. And let's get started with the season the way they always started against Harvard, who were Ivy League champs the previous season, but they pretty much didn't have any of that team that won the Ivy League last year. So this was going to be a pretty big challenge for their coach this year, Joe Resnick, to solve. And Resnick knew that this game would help his new team since Harvard has shut out Columbia over the last two years. And it was starting to look this way as Columbia would play three quarterbacks this game, with all of them getting under 40 yards passing in this game. But their running back was the story, as Solomon Johnson showed why he was going to be Rookie of the Year, as he ran for 90 yards this game and set up Columbia's only touchdown, allowing them to not get shut out for the third year in a row. But on defense, they gave up 400 plus yards again, and they were down 17 to nothing before their only score, and they would end this game losing 41 to seven. So the streak is at 42 as Columbia goes home to play highly ranked Lehigh, and they had a great passing offense and were one of the most efficient in college football that year. Meanwhile, Columbia's defense couldn't handle them at all, and it was 21 to three at the end of the first quarter, and it was 35 to three at half. Plus, Lehigh had 400 yards plus at half. Good thing for Columbia though is Lehigh sat a lot of their starters in the second half, so it could have been much worse as Lehigh had over 570 total yards, they had 300 plus passing and 200 plus rushing yards, so the final was 49 to three and the streak was at 43. And they got closer in Game 3 versus Penn, as McElravey was a former Penn assistant and Columbia was tied early in this game 7-7. Seven to seven. But after Penn scored twice before the half was over and again in the third, it was 24-7 going into the fourth quarter. Columbia kicked a field goal to cut the deficit to 14 and were driving again late, but a fumble inside the Penn 10 by Solomon Johnson gave the ball back to Penn, who then proceeded to waste a bunch of time and then kick a 77-yard punt to put Columbia back inside their own 10 and effectively end this game, and it would end 24-10. McElravey after this game was positive, saying that they were one fumble away from winning, and that might be stretching it. 
Princeton was coming to town next and they were bringing all of the Garrett Suns in again. But this time, the defense stood up to them, keeping them at 10 points by half, as well as keeping quarterback Jason Garrett guessing all game. It was 13-9 in the fourth quarter when Columbia's rushing attack came through for them as Solomon Johnson had 100 yards in this game as well as Greg Abruzzi would rush for a touchdown to give them a 16-13 lead. Columbia now having a 16-13 lead in the fourth quarter gave Princeton enough time for one more chance. Princeton and the Garrett Suns would drive Princeton all the way down for one chance to tie it on a 48-yard field goal with two seconds left. If the field goal goes, they will end their losing streak, but it doesn't end their winless streak. However, if it doesn't go, they finally get the monkey off their back and they win. Princeton got ready for the kick with two seconds left. The ball was in the air, but it fell short, landing in the end zone, and it was no good. It was over. Columbia won. The streak was finally over. All of the 5,420 people in attendance at Lawrence A. Wien Stadium rushed the field to congratulate the players. Some even took grass while dozens helped rip the field goal post down. This streak was so big that Coach McElravey was invited to David Letterman's show, but he declined as he still had to coach the rest of the season. And after that win, they probably should have ended the season because they went on a five-game losing streak before winning their final game of the season, 31-13 over Brown, meaning they were 2-8, which was their best record since 1978. And even with ending the streak and winning two games, McElravey was not renewed as the athletic officials said they felt the team lost their edge and they didn't want to play for him anymore. So Columbia would have to hire a new coach, and they would do that in Ray Tellier. He was a former Rochester, New York head coach, and he would coach the Lions from 1989 until 2002, with his best record being in 1996 when they went 8-2. and two. However, even with that record, they still would never win an Ivy League championship up to this day. And here are some crazy stats during this streak. Columbia would open up their stadium, Wien Stadium, in 1984, right at the beginning of the streak, so they lost their first 23 games at that stadium before scoring their win four years after it opened. From their previous win on October 15, 1983, until their streak-breaking win on October 8, 1988, they went 1,820 days without a win. And this streak lasted an entire presidential term. And if Columbia didn't beat Princeton on the day they beat him and instead won their final game of the season versus Brown, this streak would have went past two presidential elections as the 1988 U.S. as the 1988 U.S. presidential election happened on November 8th, 1988 just 11 days before Columbia's season-ending win over Brown. During this streak, they went 0-44, they gave up 1,492 points, or 34 points per game, and again, this could have been a lot worse because you heard a lot of teams sitting starters in the second half. Meanwhile, during this streak, they scored 456 points, or about 10 points per game. And again, this should have been a lot lower as they should have been shut out in a lot of games. But again, they were playing second and third stringers in the second half. And I don't have stats for everyone, but I have season leaders and their best passer during the 1984 through 88 season was Henry Santos in that disastrous 1985 season. And their best runner during this time was John Chirico, who led in rushing both times that he played with less than 550 yards in 1985 and 1986. And after going over all of these stats and reading into the streak, I would love to have seen how this team would have been if Garrett stayed in 1986, because then he would have had at least one of his sons playing that year in Judd at running back, which probably would have gotten them at least one win. And if they would have not won in 86, they probably or definitely would have won in 87 because Jason would have been quarterback then. But I think the streak really got the length it got because of the firing of Coach Garrett, or I guess the resignation of Coach Garrett, because when he left, that 1986 season was so bad for them because so many players were demoralized or left or just didn't want to play anymore. So they pretty much wasted an entire season before they got back to playing pretty well in 1987. So to me, I just think that that firing of Garrett was the real reason why this streak lasted so long. 
Anyway, though, thank you so much for going on this very long journey with me on this deep dive of the Columbia losing streak that lasted pretty much most of the 1980s. Uh, as always, though, you can find me on Twitter at SportsWrong, and make sure you give this video a like. Make sure you share this video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. And also make sure you leave me a comment. Tell me what videos you want me to go over, what teams you want me to deep dive. And just so you know, I don't just deep dive losing streaks. I will be deep diving winning streaks and other streaks in college sports. So that'll be coming up very soon. But thank you so much for hanging out with me and look for more content coming up for Wrong Sports next month.